Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech. This week, I want to show you how to fine tune your cockpit to get the most for your personal needs. I'm going to talk about some of the finer details as well as some of the wider considerations for contact point adjustment. So first things first, we need to make sure everything is straight and aligned. Now with our handlebars, getting them straight, square to your direction of travel is obviously really important, but we do not line our stem up with the wheel in front of it. We don't do this for a couple of reasons. One, it's quite inconsistent. There's a lot of room to go off and yeah, it's not that accurate. It even gets harder when you take into account shorter stems and mud guards. So we wanna stay away from that. What we want to do is using our handlebars, looking down the bike as so, we're gonna go off our handlebars and get them lined up with the fork crowns. This is a far more accurate and consistent way of doing it and will yield better results. So we've got our handlebars straight, what next? Well, we're gonna talk about how we roll the bars, whether we roll them further back or further forward. Now, this is really, really important, okay? Because what we want is we want our upper body to be in a nice, strong position. The problem is if we have our bars too far back, we tend to have our, our wrists quite low. That brings our elbows in and down and this isn't a very good position. Imagine you're doing a press up. It makes it a lot harder to do a press up here than out here, okay? So a nice strong position. Conversely, if we have our wrists rolled too far forwards and we take those impacts, well, you can almost be pivoting around your wrist going forward. Yet again, it's gonna fatigue you. It's not a consistently strong position and it's gonna make you feel very unstable. So how we roll the bars has a huge consequence on our body position. So I want you to think about getting a nice, strong position leading from your wrists up to your elbows, okay? Now, we all know that how we position our brakes also really plays its part, but I'm gonna come back onto that later on because it's super important. So when you set your bar roll, I want you to do so with your fingers away from the levers because we're gonna come on back onto that. I want you to do it so you get a nice, strong position just with your forearms. So you've hit the nail on the head and you've got your roll back perfect. Excellent. But what if you haven't? What if you still are struggling to find yourself nice and comfortable on your handlebars? Well, then it's time to think about the geometry of the bars themselves. So the first dimension I'm gonna talk about is back sweep. So if you imagine how your handlebars are on the outer extremities, okay? Now, if they were very flat, your wrists would be joining perp in a perpendicular fashion. Now that might not necessarily suit you, in fact, it won't suit a lot of people because as you've got nice wide handlebars, if they are coming exactly perpendicular, you might find that you get some kind of nerve issues, some pain in your forearm from things like the carpal tunnel, the ulnar nerve, which in my experience, I've suffered from it and it can be very painful indeed. And the problem is that the knock-on consequence of that is a reduction in grip strength, which then means more fatigue, which then means more tired and then the problem goes in a vicious circle. So you don't want to be too flat. Similarly, you know, those kind of comfortable back sweep bars you might find on a town bike or a kind of a more touring bike setup might be very comfortable for cruising around on flat roads. But when we ride aggressively, you might indeed find that they just don't have the control. Now, sweep is something, as I alluded to earlier on, that is really affected by width. If you've seen road riders riding on the flats of their bars, they do so quite happily. That's because it's quite a narrow position and there's not large amounts of leverage at play. The problem is when you want large amounts of control on a very wide bar. Different bars, like different bikes, will have different geometry and finding something that works for you is really, really important. If you find a handlebar that you particularly like, by all means, make a note of it. Now, you might find different numbers work for you, but a typical dimension of back sweep on a handlebar is around nine degrees. So what other dimensions are there? Well, a big one, and probably one you're familiar with, is rise. Well, what is rise? Because it's often misunderstood. So to get a really clear idea of what the dimension means, I think it's best to think about BMX handlebar. So from the center of the stem clamp, I want you to think up, and that rise until it levels out, until it goes to the 22.2 diameter for your grips, that's the rise. Now, anything it does after that second bend is actually another dimension, which I'm gonna come on to later. So that's the angle of our bar taken care of. But a dimension I mentioned earlier on was rise. Now, what is rise? And what are the benefits of having bars of different rise? So a high rise bar 
is really good because it's a great way to maneuver your weight or at least give you the ability to do so over the rear axle. So I want you to imagine riding down a very steep shooter gate that's got a drop halfway down. With a high rise bar, you've got the option to really bring your weight back and kind of unweight the front wheel as you go over it. Now, similarly, a low rise bar or a more weighted front end will make it harder to do so. So what's the benefit of a low rise bar? Well, because there is more weight on the front wheel, it often isn't favored in really steep terrain. But one thing it does prove very popular for is being able to weight the front end in flatter turns. It's got more of a precise feeling. You know, with your high rise bars, when you're riding with a bar that's too high or a front end that's too high, it can feel, well, a lack of precision. And that's just because there isn't the weight there. What you're doing is you're trading off that precise feeling for the ability to manipulate the bike in terms of your weight more. Personally, I find the places I really don't like a high end is in kind of medium speed turns because I just feel when I'm leaning the bike, very unstable. It doesn't have that planted feeling that I want, but it's one of those things, horses for courses, but I think a lot of the time it is very dependent on the terrain you ride. So I've talked about descending a lot, but we also climb a lot on our mountain bikes. Now, some people do like quite a high front end to climb because they feel it lets them get air into their lungs, but a serious XC rider would almost always favor a low front end. This is because it gives quite a stable, almost planted feel on steeper terrain because there is being more weight exercised over the front axle. Yet again, no hard and fast answer here. It's personal preference, sorry. But why on earth would you go to all the effort of choosing a different handlebar when you have stem spaces at your disposal? Well, it's for a very good reason. So as you add height to a bar, you're doing it on a vertical plane. When you add stem spaces above or below, you're moving that stem along the steering axis. So what that means is the higher you have your handlebar, the closer it is to the rider, and you're basically reducing the length of the riding position. Similarly, when you lower the bar, it moves it away from the rider's seated position. Now, is it useful to do? Absolutely. Would I encourage you to do it? Absolutely. Go out there and experiment. After all, it comes at no cost to you. But if you do find a position that works for you and you're running a particularly low rise bar, well, it can be a way to get extra reach out of your bike for the same cockpit dimensions, which sounds pretty good to me. Now, I just mentioned the word there, reach. This is, well, I'm walking on very thin ice indeed. So when we talk about reach, reach, technically speaking, is a frame measurement. Sometimes you'll find yourself talking about reach as an overall bike measurement, which I think is forgivable. Now, context is important, but I'd also say, you could say to a road cyclist, reach, and they would think, hmm, handlebar reach. So it does depend. Now, you wanna use language that is very consistent and clear, but sometimes uh, that consistency often isn't throughout the bike industry. Something that categorically isn't reach, however, is stem length. Now, stem length is one of, I think for my money, the more interesting subjects in cycling, especially when you talk about super short stems, different amounts of trail, offset, leaning the bike, it's fascinating. But to keep it simple, first of all, I'm gonna go back to that example I mentioned earlier on when talking about riding a steep chute and a long or a short stem. As you can imagine, if you had to pull up over a drop whilst riding something very steep, you would find it a lot easier to do with a short stem. Now, a longer stem, like with the lower rise bar, puts more weight upon the front wheel, which is great for going uphill, downhill, hmm, not always your friend. When you're riding a bike with a long stem, it's a bit like an oil tanker. It likes to hold its course and it takes more persuasion to get moving. But we found in recent years with new geometry, what you can do is pair a wider bar with a shorter stem. And you basically you take that length that was in front of the steering axis and move it behind. Now this plays really nicely with modern bike geometry. How we keep our front wheels stable is incredibly complicated and it's the product of a couple of different dimensions. Yes, stem length plays its part, but largely because it affects how much weight we are actuating upon the front wheel, but also things like trail, which is 
the result of a formula which can be affected by head angle, offset, axle height, the list goes on. We've actually done some really fun videos on these which I hope are quite informative. Doddy did his Geometry 101 and I looked into fork offset, so I'm going to include those videos in the description below so you can go do some extra homework. The other consequences of stem length and what they interact with just goes on and on. Now there are some bike manufacturers now that actually request that you change the width of your handlebars before you change your stem length because they don't want to affect the kind of design ethos for which they designed the bike around. Similarly, you've got to think that your stem length is actually working inversely to how much you roll the bars back, how swept back they are. And you'd be surprised at how much it can vary. Now, how on earth can bar width be a substitute for stem length? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Well, the narrower your bars are, the further away they are from your chest. Conversely, when you have wide bars, it brings your chest to your center of mass closer to the bars. Now, there's an old adage that, you know, two centimeter of handlebar width equals one centimeter of top tube. But I'd take that with a reasonably large pinch of salt. Now, coming back to leverage, a wider bar will help you actuate more leverage upon the front wheel, which is really handy when we want to resist external forces, trying to knock our wheel off course. Now, there are a couple of reasons perhaps you wouldn't want to ride wide bars, or at least I wouldn't wholeheartedly recommend them. I think your own stature and the geometry of your body is absolutely vital. You don't want to be riding like this, and that's for sure. There are a couple of other reasons though. Your stem length, your bike design, you know, the geometry, you might even find things like the terrain you ride, and also, you know, what you ride through. People often complain, sometimes fairly, sometimes not so much, that they hit trees more often with wide handlebars. Why, why is this unfair? How could it be so? Well, I think, you know, as mountain bikers, we often want to go quickly. We're often trying to go quickly through trees. So I know that if this is a tree, I'm gonna put my hand there. And it doesn't really matter what this hand's doing if I'm riding you know, old 650 bars or 800s. That hand is gonna be as close to that tree as I can possibly make it. And accidents happen. Eventually, I'm gonna punch the tree. And that's just that. Now, something that's really important about handlebar width, and it's a good opportunity to speak about it, we often get asked why one brand costs more than another when it's basically the same thing. Now, the reasons for that are varied and the list is long, but one big thing is quality control. Now, I want you to go to your handlebars and measure the centre markings from end to end because you would be amazed about how many handlebars don't have those millimetre adjustments anywhere near the centre. So before you go spending 15 minutes tapping each end to get them absolutely bang on central. Get the tape measure and make sure that those measurements are where they say they are. So we have most things absolutely bang on, but it's time to think about our bar controls. So first thing is brakes. Now, if I'm running a wide bar, I want to use every single millimeter of real estate that I can, but this is important, okay? If you're running your hands to the outer extremities of the bar, I want you to look at what your finger's doing, okay? And it should be working, you know, parallel to the direction of travel. Sometimes you see people kind of stretching for their brakes as they're running their controls very inboard. And that's gonna give so much fatigue and fatigue is gonna become something of a buzzword as your hand stretches and, you know, overcompensates. Similarly, if you're running your brakes too close to the outside of the bar, you know, you might find that the lever is fouling on your other fingers as you're pulling them, which is obviously what we don't want. It's the same thing with your controls, okay? You know, people often have kind of little scars there and rub marks all over because that's just how they how they have the handlebar set up, but it doesn't have to be like that. Now, I'm not gonna say to take a file to your stuff as a first result, but if you know what you like and you know that you get a particular sweet spot that always causes you pain, I'd probably take a file to it, if I'm honest. How you have your brake set up in terms of the bite point is also very, very personal. My ideal setup is to have loads of free stroke and then, then bite very sharply, just, and I mean just before, the blade bottoms out on the grip. Most people get my bikes and they think it's absolutely horrible, they can't ride it, they don't trust it, that's fair enough. But for me, I just find I want my hand to be almost in a fist, I feel it's a really strong position for me, and it helps keep arm pump at bay. 
but it is a personal thing. And you know, don't feel you need to do what other people tell you, just find what works for you. Now the big one and something of a current hot topic, lever angle. So I'm gonna tell you a bit of a story, <whistles> lucky you. So for years, I have had my brake lever set up around 45 degrees and I've never had any problems. I've ridden like this, well, pretty much the entire time I've been riding. Downhill bikes, trail bikes, enduro bikes, whatever, no problem at all. Until I went to Chile and the descents there was so long and sustained, I, I thought my hands were just gonna fall off. It was like nothing I'd ever known. And so personally, I'm on a bit of a journey of flattening out my brake levers. You might have seen some pro riders go to extreme lengths, but why do they do it? Well, it's because of the way that we weight our hands. So as you can imagine, if we're getting nice and steep, and bearing in mind our body weight's wanting to come forward and almost you know, leave the bike behind under heavy compression, it's leaving a huge amount of work for those fingers and then into your forearm to do. But if you can have your blades slightly higher, it can be a really nice position and you know, help you achieve a very strong position. Now that's why earlier on I said you want to get your handlebars set up in terms of the roll without the levers on because I think for my money they're kind of different things and you want to be treating them independently of one another. Another thing that is really important to consider when thinking about the angle of our brakes is the fact that, listen, not all of the human bodies out there are symmetrical and that's just the way it is, especially even if you did get a symmetrical human body and then you send them mountain biking for 10 years and they hit trees, rocks, fall off things, fall onto things, all that sort of business, they're probably not gonna be symmetrical by the end. So people with shoulder injuries, people with hand injuries, arm injuries, don't feel you have to have you know, a symmetrical setup. Why? Just because it looks aesthetically pleasing, which it does look good admittedly, but it's just for vanity. Find something that works for you. There are so many pro riders out there, you just gotta look through bike checks and people you know all sorts of stuff going on. I even know of a World Cup rider that for years felt they rode better with their stem off center. So whatever works for you is the way to do it, okay? We're all proportioned differently and just don't worry about it. If you are particular on your angle setups, you can get apps on your phone, you can get inclinometers quite cheap off eBay and Amazon. And what they'll do is help you consistently achieve the same setup. Once you do get your bars in a place that you like and you get your, you know, your controls set up to the nth degree, I really suggest just getting some Sharpie or permanent marker, making some marks around the controls so you can get them in the same position every single time. Having the right amount of flex and compliance is so, so important. Now, when you do spend more money on a handlebar, what you're probably gonna get is something that is compliant in one plane, yet stiff in another which is something of the holy grail. The handlebars are often the culprit for you know, feeling large amounts of harshness or vibration. But to be honest, it's not always the guilty party. Think about your front wheel. If you have ultra stiff wheels, honestly, it's just gonna be feeding loads of trail feedback right to your hands. And the handlebar, don't forget, can only go off the information it's given. If it's given loads of harsh, high frequency rattling, that's what it's gonna to give to you, at least past the majority of it's on. I also want you to think about tire pressure, fork setup, so many things can affect it. So yes, your handlebar can be the culprit, but it is one piece in a larger picture. Wider handlebars do tend to be a bit more flexy, or at least historically was the case. They also say the same about high rise ones. I think though, to be honest with you, with modern manufacturing, it's probably not as noticeable as it used to be, if at all. Now, as you know, on GMBN Tech, we love mountain bike tech, but it isn't always the responsible party. If you're having consistent pain in your forearms, things like, you know, the nerves around here, your carpal tunnel, you know, think about maybe some strengthening exercises, think about maybe some stretches, or going to see a physical therapist, because there's some things that just getting a different set of handlebars or a different clamp diameter won't be able to help with, okay? You might actually need to do some strengthening and conditioning to ride long days in the park, etc. Now, a really big factor that is absolutely worth thinking about is your grip material, the diameter, the general feel of them, because that will have a massive effect on hand fatigue. Now, something that's really important is, you know, I know some people that say, go gloveless because it's more grip. I know people that say, wear gloves because it's more grip. It's something that's really personal. 
I've got horrible clammy hands, so in the summer months I have to wear gloves whether I like it or not, and in the winter I can get by without. Other people find that they just get the worst pump if they do wear gloves. It's very personal, okay? But experiment, see what happens. You've also got systems like RevGrip, which actually add a bit of play in the grips themselves, negate any issues around rattling on the bars. I think one of the biggest factors in the way our hands feel, especially when riding you know, really rough tracks, is braking power. And this comes in a couple of different ways. So the first one is actually what we do with our fingers, okay? Now, having two fingers on the blade isn't gonna affect the power of the caliper, but it is gonna drastically affect the amount of control you have on the handlebar. So one finger braking is an absolute must. In the last few years, disc brakes have become a whole lot more powerful, especially on your downhill brakes. Now, obviously this is about stopping distance. They want something that's gonna stop them very quickly. But the amount of, you know, pro riders that basically feel the big differences in hand fatigue would surprise you because they're clinging on for absolute dear life. They're hitting things so hard. Now you don't have to be riding at World Cup pace to be able to reap the World Cup advantages of better braking technology. So if you've kind of feel you've exhausted all your options and you just can't understand why you're getting such bad hand pump, but you're riding 160 mil rotors, that could be it. Or maybe you're riding brakes that are poorly bled and don't really have any bite. That will add so much fatigue onto your hands, okay? So I want you to think about all the elements. Think about the bigger picture. So think about, yeah, the size of your rotors. Think about what compounds you use. There are some brands that if I use the metallic, the lack of initial bite tires out my hands. Similarly, there are some brands I use that the organic, you know, pumps up under long sustained efforts and I feel like I've arm wrestled Pat Butcher towards the end of it. You know, experiment as much as you can. Another thing is tire choice. Now, if you're riding really loose terrain all the time, Things like semi-slicks, just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. You know, get something that's gonna give you really good braking feel, okay? Because that will help you feel fresher for longer, get more runs in, you can't lose. So now it's time for the good news. The standards in handlebars aren't that varied. So everything goes off the same grip diameter, or at least pretty much everything. I can't think of anything that doesn't. And you get the 31.8 or the 35 mil clamp at the stem. And that's it, which is great, I think so at least. Now, the last part of the show, and this is really important, okay? I mentioned it before earlier on. I don't think we've ever done a homework assignment before, but I think we're starting. I want everyone to go out and experiment, okay? Because you're gonna find things that are undoubtedly wrong, that are inferior, that are worse. But you at least will then quantify what that feels like. It also means maybe you'll find something that works better. There's such a complicated relationship between all parts of our cockpit and contact points that sometimes finding out and experimenting is just absolutely invaluable and it's going to help you problem solve in the future. So, homework, never thought I'd see the day. Now guys, if you liked watching, don't forget to like and subscribe. Get in the comments below. Let me know what you think and if you've done your bloody homework. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.